Welcome to What Do You Want To Do, the show that will hopefully help you figure out what you want to do in life or reconnect you to what you love doing. Each show has a guest who is doing what they want to do, whether it's in their career or in addition to their regular job. Most importantly, we want to help you realize that no matter your age, you too can do what you want to do if you have the will to do it. Now here's your host, Leonard Kaplan. Welcome to What Do You Want to Do. My guest today is Kevin Lewis. Kevin is a published author. Not many people can say that. Let's take a look at his career trajectory and see how he got there. Today on What Do You Want to Do, my friend, my former student, published author, and all-around successful creative guy, Kevin Lewis. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Len. Happy to be here. Yes, and you were my student back in 2003, I would say. Is that? No, I think it was 2001, because that's when I graduated. 2001. I didn't think it was that long ago. Wow. Okay, that is a long time. Almost as old as my 99 Corolla. (laughs) So now you, when we were in school and I was your teacher, you talked about writing and by goodness, you did it. You went through with a career in writing. Tell us how that came about and did you ever consider anything else? So I definitely never thought I was going to be a writer when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I um, always kind of envisioned, or I always, I think, aspired when I was a kid to become a police officer. Um, my grandfather mm-hmm. was uh, the, one, of the, one of the former police chiefs of my home city of Marrows, Massachusetts. So I always kind of, I, I always wanted to be like a, a police officer and follow in his footsteps. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do when I was a kid for the longest time. And, and I kind of realized after a while that I probably wouldn't make a very good cop or like detective because, you know, sometimes as I've kind of been quoted as saying is, you know, I have trouble, you know, finding a, you know, a roll of paper towel in my house. So I'm just like, yeah, that, that might not be the career for me. Yeah. But uh, I actually discovered that I wanted to be a writer. It's actually an interesting story. When I was in elementary school, mm-hmm. mom, uh, you know, when I was in elementary school, I think it was either first or second grade, my parents discovered that I was actually having difficulty in school that I was actually struggling, struggling with, you know, you know, you know, comprehension, you know, reading comprehension, right, putting paragraphs and, you know, like a, telling a simple story from beginning, middle and end. So I actually, you know, I, you know, am, you know, I do have some, you know, learning disabilities that they discovered. So my parents hired a tutor, <coughs> excuse me, my parents hired a tutor. Uh, her name was, uh, Pat Harrington, and she was a speech and language uh, pathologist. So she would actually come to the house and, you know, work on, you know, reading comprehension and, you know, you know, sentence structure and, you know, story structure with me. Um, And one of our assignments was to write a um, kind of like a, uh, like a, basically just write a story. Right. And I just, you know, being a, like a little kid back in the, you know, this is back in the nineties, I was a huge Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan. Okay. So, you know, like I loved the cartoon and the, the first and or second movie had just come out. I know like, I know the first movie had just come out, yeah. um, during that time. And I was a huge fan of it. So, you know, she asked, you know, Pat said that, you know, you could pick whatever topic you want to write. And I decided to do a sort of, you know, picture book novelization of the first live action movie. And I wrote it out. She helped me write it out. And I actually did all of, I, I drew all of the illustrations very badly, but, uh, you know, that was my first, story that I recall telling uh, that, you know, writing it down. And I kind of got hooked ever since, you know, that kind of, that kind of, you know, you know, piqued my interest in writing. So after that, you know, writing assignment, I started, you know, writing, you know, creating my own stories and characters and I've been doing it, you know, kind of ever since. So you go back a long way with this aspiration. That's great. Uh, now, what about the horror component? Because you like horror stuff. I, I, I yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge horror horror buff, uh, and it's interesting because, again, when I when I was a kid, I was not a horror buff at all. I had friends who were big horror fans, but I was not one of them. I grew up 
you know, with a, with an appreciation for like ghost stories, uh-huh. kind of like you know maybe like spooky Halloween esque kind of like stories. Yeah. Uh, my favorite growing up was the Disney version of the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and so and I ended up obviously I read um, you know I ultimately read. Washington Irving's original story, but you know, like the story of Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman, that was my favorite ghost story growing up. So I liked kind of like, you know, kids kind of, you know, like children's esque kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, you know, picture books and like, you know, middle grade kind of mm-hmm. like spooky kind of stories. But I was not like a horror, like, you know, like I was not a horror fan, you know, um, you know, movie wise, you know, anything, you know, anything Stephen King, like I knew who Stephen King was when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I did not read him. I'm just like, nope. I, you know, I, he's, he's that, he, he writes that horror stuff. It's like, nope, that is not for me. And I think, um, not to put, uh, kind of, um, you know, throw my parents under the bus, but they wouldn't let me, uh, you know, watch any of that stuff, you know, growing up, you know, when I was right. a kid. So I think that was, part of the reason why you know i would have friends that were saying like yeah like i would watch this i watched this horror movie i'm just like well my parents wouldn't let me watch that movie so i my parents wouldn't let me watch that stuff you know kind of growing up so when i was in sixth grade i was in a um i was in a class and one of my classmates discovered i think that i was reading and he was saying you know have you ever read stephen king and i said like no i mean again again it's you know i knew who he was but Mm -hmm. i you know, I never, I never read him. So I said, no. And he says, you may want to like, you know, try, you know, give him a try. Uh, he's, he's really good. So I said, you know what, it's like, I'm in sixth grade, you know, what could be scarier, you know, might as well. It's like, I'm in sixth grade. So why not? You know, it's sixth grade, scary enough as it is. So I, you know, asked my parents and they, you know, for Christmas, you know, I, you know, I got my first three Stephen King books and I started with the first Stephen King book I started. And then I read was Pet Cemetery, mm-hmm. And, you know, it was that book. And then the second book I read after him was Salem's Lot, Okay. which I mean, Salem's Lot, I think definitely sealed the deal. I'm just like, okay, yeah, horror. Like, this is my new favorite genre. I loved what the horror genre I think can do. I mean, there's so much that goes into a horror story. I mean, you have, you know, like, you know, horror, suspense, mystery, you, you have romance, uh, sometimes you can have fantastical elements, you know, thrown in. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be supernatural at all. It could be, you know, like a, uh, you know, like a, an everyday kind of, you know, story. It, it just so many elements that go into a horror, um, you know, you're going to a horror story. And I think King was really the one who influenced, who inspired me to become a writer. I knew I wanted to be a writer at that point. But Stephen King was the one that inspired me to become an actual horror writer, uh, and I think it—I think it was because of his ability to kind of create these worlds and, and create these believable characters that he th- would just throw into these, you know, kind of horrific and you know a lot of times supernatural situations and how they, you know, how they dealt with these, you know, supernatural situations. That just fascinated me. So that's that's what got me into horror writing. No, and the horror before, genre itself. Before King, what was your favorite genre? Just the ghost stuff? I think it was the ghost. It was the ghost stories. Like I was a huge, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I, I read the, all the Benicula books. I don't know if there's any more since, but Benicula was kind of like middle grade-esque kind of horror it was yeah. it was supernatural but it, again it wasn't uh, it wasn't like it was sort of a, maybe kind of goosebumps level but uh, maybe a little below that and it was mm-hmm. it was spooky but it was there was a mystery to them. all of them were mysteries um but it was yeah it was definitely you know the binicular books those were huge uh i was a huge fan of those books you know when i was a kid um i loved detective stories uh you know mystery stories mm-hmm. um, i would um even though i couldn't you know watch like horror movies i would watch like mystery movies you know like all the yeah. all the classic columbo um yeah, you know movies and yeah i mean so that's what i was interested in as oh. a kid interesting so now in the movies and i think i understand your parents concern because mm-hmm. The movies have become very unkid friendly for the most part, uh, unless it's specifically for a kid. And even even some kids' movies, there's some questionable things that I personally, you know. Um, but I think a big part of what puts parents off toward horror is 
there is a little bit of uh, a blurry line sometimes between horror and gore. Okay. And you're knowledgeable about this stuff. When do you think that started to occur historically? In terms of, you mean like the blood and the gore? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, things are spooky, but yeah. like they go, like I'm thinking of the movie It, for example. Yes. It, I would not classify as a horror story in your style and the style that you admire, like in King. You know, I would classify that as gore. You know, it, some elements of it are are very gory. Uh, mm. And, and what, what springs to mind is in the very beginning of it, both in the novel, uh, and, which is a classic, and the at least the you know like the remake of it, where you know little George Dembro, you know, gets killed by Pennywise. It is very it is very graphic in both the novel and yeah. in the movie. Uh, and there were other elements of it that were you know definitely you know definitely gory. I think. What you know, I think it can be both. I think gory and kind of your staple kind of horror movie, uh, horror story, because there is this kind of demonic, kind of cosmic esque kind of creature, kind of you know terrorizing this town and, and like you know like the children in, um, you know in Derry, Maine. But uh, I think it, you're you're right. I think it draws a uh, kind of a um, kind of a fine line between gore and you know, um, kind of the, the, the classic horror tropes that don't necessarily have mm -hmm. um, gore attached to them. I think, you know, I think, you know, horror, horror, horror stories can be gory and not gory. I think it depends on what you're going for in terms of scare tactics. Right. Um, I think certain, you know, certain movies like slasher movies, they're, you know, it's, you know, you have a psycho chasing you with a weapon. It's, you know, uh, and it's supposed to be, you know, bloody. Uh, but there are some slasher movies that don't have gore in them. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe like some slasher movies that were either made for TV uh, along those lines, or like a killer targeting you, uh, or mm -hmm. just certain, like John Carpenter's Halloween, there's no gore in them. People get, you know, people get killed and knifed, but you don't actually see blood and gore. There's reasons, you know, and there may be some backstory, you know, behind that, but it, Sometimes it's you know it 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 it, it kind of depends on uh, the kind of the um, the horror factor you're, you're going for. Right. Very very interesting. Now let's describe to the audience here who are aspiring to do what you do mm -hmm. and get paid for it. What was your training and which direction did you go in? Because there's a lot of things out there. There's online classes. Yep. There's Writers Digest classes. There's the traditional college route where you uh, major in fiction, I guess, mm -hmm. or in literature. So which one did you choose? And are you satisfied with your choice? So I've kind of had I've kind of done a little of everything. I've done, you know, the, the, you know, the classic, you know, like the college route. Um, I went to Emerson College. Um, I did take some creative writing courses um, at Emerson that were very helpful. So I, and, and currently I'm taking courses, hopefully hoping to apply to a master's program at Harvard um, Division of Continuing Education. Wow. So I've taken, mm. yeah, I've taken um, courses in, um, so at Harvard um, DCE, uh, you know, creative, all creative writing courses. I've taken short story writing courses. Uh, a uh, kind of elements of the writer's craft course. Uh, this past summer, I took a screenwriting course. So all of that has helped, you know, improve my writing. Um, I'm a member of uh, a couple of writers, um, horror writers groups. And I know a lot of horror writers in the field. And I've actually, um, two of my, two of my, uh, my favorite horror writers, um, Christopher Golden and James A. Moore, Mm -hmm. They use they taught, um, you know, they, they taught like uh, it's called River City Writers, which is a uh, kind of a writing, uh, you know, um, you know, kind of, you know, um, it's basically like a writing writing organization where they actually teach you, um, you know, elements of the craft. Uh, I've I've taken seminars from them on, uh, you know, agents and um, quarry letters, uh, or you know, co uh, contracts. I've taken. I actually took an intensive, um, you know, writing. Uh, I think it was it was a writing uh, your novel course, where I uh, and among uh, 
a bunch of my writer friends actually, you know, we, we participated. It was four weeks in November and we, it was once a week, we would, you know, write, we would um, send, uh, you know, Chris and Jim our writing samples and they would critique, critique them. And again, just, you know, just invaluable, you know, feedback, um, you know, right. from, from them. Uh, I've, I've, uh, uh, participated in writers workshops, um, so, you know, you know, writing clubs and, you know, we've had, uh, you know, uh, I've had my work, uh, and I've been, and I've read other works and critiqued them as well. And I've had my work critiqued. Um, I think, um, but also I've, I've, you know, with the writer friends that I have, and, you know, some of them are just uh, some wonderful, wonderful friends that I've met through the horror writing community. Uh, you know, we, we beta read each other. So I've had people beta read. Uh, my work, short stories, um, a couple of novellas I've written, one of them, Cat Creeper, I had that beta read, and I've had um, my stories, you know, professionally edited as well. So I've kind of done a lot. Okay, now, this is asking for honesty now. You've had all this training, different types of training. Are there any that you would choose over the other? Are there any that you would say, ah, that was a waste of time? Or are there any that you would say, well, that, if I had to do only one, is the best? That's a, that's a tough question, because I think, you know, I, I, I've learned so much from all of them. I think, it, I think it depends on the group of people that you have and what mm. kind of advice they're giving you. You know, some, some advice you're, you're going to agree with and say, that that definitely that works for me and and some other advice you may say you know what that just doesn't work for my you know for my story it's not that they're like the whoever's critiquing is bad i it's just maybe kind of either what they saw and what kind of you know you know kind of goes with you i think <laughs> i think probably the two, you know like the, the probably the the top three are definitely i think writing workshops um and like, you know, like, you know, and, you know, having your writing writer friends who you trust, I think, completely to beta read your stories, because I think they most likely will know you as, a, you know, maybe not necessarily as a person, but like as a writer, you know, what your interests are, what you're kind of what you're trying to convey. That might be maybe the like the best thing uh, is to choose, you know, like a writer uh, or maybe a few people to that you, that you really know and trust to kind of give you really honest feedback um you know trust is you, the issue trust is the issue because yes that's a key i think that uh there are a lot of writers groups and i would agree <laughs> that you you have to develop some sort of trust before you're showing your stuff that's pretty you know intimate really uh exactly to, yeah. before the general audience uh sees it so I have a lot of friends that I trust. I read their stuff and they read my stuff, but I've never made that leap to join a club of people that I don't know. That kind of really scares me. You know what I mean? It, it, you look like at any time you send your workout, to, I think even to your friends, I think it's nerve wracking because it's like, are they going to like it? Are they going to, you know, not like it? And, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I go through the same thing. It's, you know, it's nerve wracking, uh, at least with people, you know, it, it's, it's your, you know, I think you feel a little safer, but still you, you, you want that you, you want honesty. You don't want someone to, you know, obviously be mean to you. Um, and, but you want someone who is brutally honest with you enough to say, this is what works. This is where what needs to be, you know, in his or her opinion, you know, what needs to be improved upon. Constructive criticism. That's great. Okay. Yeah. But what I was getting at is the P word plagiarism. How do you know that when you're sending your stuff out and they're reading it, that they're not liberally borrowing to be kind uh, your idea and expanding on that? I think yeah, that, and that's, uh, that's, that's the big question. It's again, I think it's just, it's trust. I think you need to trust whoever you're giving it to that, uh, you know, hope and pray that they do not steal your stuff. Uh, you know, I think, I think with screenwriting, I, I, um, I would always register it with the writer's guild just to, uh, because I know that that's, 
Um, and it's also quick and easy to do. It's you could do it in like seconds. Um, but I think that's, you know, if, if you're having your screenplay, you know, looked at, uh, I think either way, whether you're having someone read it or you're sending it to a screenwriting agent um, or manager or company to definitely, you know, um, protect that because I know that that's there, you know, and it's quick and easy to do that. But I think with prose writing, I was always told um, back, it was, this was years ago, um, you don't really, particularly with short stories, you don't, you, you don't copyright short stories. Mm -hmm. um, but I think novels, uh, you know, I think it's, you just kind of again. It, it goes to the trust issue. Do you trust this person to right to you know not steal you know plagiarize your work? So let's talk about screenwriting for a second because I took Emerson's screenwriting program. I have a certificate in it for all for all that's worth. You know they teach you how to use the right brads to hold it together. Yep, and uh, the right paper to buy. And all yep. that. And I'm wondering now, my, I, my course was a long time ago. Yours is must, must be a lot more recent. Uh, d does it, has it changed? Is it all digital now? Do you still have to, to, to send it in a physical way? Meaning to... To submit <laughs> to studios or, or whatever. Unfortunately, I don't, that's not something I know. I, I haven't, I've had a, uh, a professional screenwriter um, look over my script, yeah. uh, which he, he this, uh, this person uh, gave invaluable feedback on. Um, he's, yeah. he's a horror, um, you know, writer like me. Yeah. Uh, and, but other than that, I have not sent it to, I haven't actually submitted screenplays to um, agents or companies in a long time. I'm still, that's actually one of the other things I'm working on. Um, now is to kind of work on one more revision of a horror screenplay before I really start to send it out to either, you know, festivals or agents or companies. You are successful in, you, you have Cat Keeper. That's a novella. I want to get yep. to that in a second. Uh, and you're also writing screenplays. When you think of a story, how do you decide whether it's going to be prose or screenplay? So I've, I think my, my first love is prose writing. That's what I always wanted to be, you know, when I, since I discovered sort of my love uh, and my passion for writing. Yeah. So everything I've always kind of envisioned always kind of, you know, I just thought that it's either going to be a short story or uh, like a book of some kind, either a no novel or a novella. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, you know, when I would talk to you, um, you know, in high school, in our classes, uh, you mm -hmm. know, it was you that kind of got me into screenwriting. And we kind of talked about, you know, screenwriting and films, and that kind of got me interested in, in kind of, you know, screenwriting. So I kind of, you know, I, I always would, I always thought it would be cool, um, even before that, that some of my stuff would be like, maybe uh, adapted. Uh, but I yeah. never really thought of doing it myself. So, you know, when I, you know, you know, when I used to talk to you, you know, you kind of got me hooked on screenwriting. So I, hmm. it's, it's kind of, you know, it's sometimes I've, I've envisioned stuff where I've said to myself, I could either write this as a book or like a screenplay. Yeah. And sometimes I've actually started, um, you know, working on it as either a book or a screenplay. I've either started like, you know, writing out scenes or like an mm -hmm. outline or like a treatment, mm -hmm. but one 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 example, which is a kind of an interesting example, uh, is uh, you know one of the first kind of you know horror stories I started writing on, which was Cat Creeper. But another one was a vampire story that has just changed over mm -hmm. the years. I ended up writing a it was probably like a forty five or fifty thousand word book, mm -hmm. and then when I was at Emerson, I started you know working. I started writing the screenplay version of that at Emerson. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up uh, revising it and uh, retooling it and just, you know, completely finishing the screenplay at, at Emerson. I still haven't done anything with it. I've tried to kind of sell it over the years, but I've since started transposing the unproduced screenplay of that back to a novel and re re rewriting the actual novel from the screenplay version. So, but I, you know, I, some, some, some scripts like the horror script that I want to, um, that I want to revise and send out that was solely, I just, I, I wanted to, I wanted to write that as a screenplay. I, I knew it, it would only work as a screenplay and not um, as like a book because um, it, it, it's a slasher movie kind of in the vein of like Scream and I know what you did last summer so it was made to be a, um, a feature length screen. Right, 
Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. So, huh? No, so but as a whole, you you prefer prose to screenplay. Yes, although sometimes with screen screenwriting, uh, it's interesting because you know uh, one of the things I'm trying to get better at in with prose writing is descriptions. Uh, to try to, you know, I think that goes to my, um, kind of speaks to my, you know, my, my learning disability. I'm not 100% sure, but that's one of the things I want to strive to, you know, better myself. Right. And with screenwriting, you don't have to necessarily describe every, you know, everything. No. So I kind of like that about screenwriting, but it, it's more about just getting the action and, and keep going with the action. Describe a little bit, you know, what's supposed to happen, who says what, and kind of keep going. And I kind of like that kind of fast pacedness of a screenplay. Um, to that of a novel, but you know, I, I love novels. I love novellas. I, I love reading them. But as I find that interesting about screenwriting, but I just I haven't sold one yet. <laughs> so speak to the difference between a novella and a novel, because you pick a no novella for for Cat Creeper. So a no basically, uh, kind of the, the the basic difference between a novella and a novel is. Um, the main thing is is word length, you know. Um, novellas, depending on the publisher, usually range from, I'd say maybe twenty thousand words to maybe fifty thousand or a little under fifty thousand word range for a novella. For a novel, uh, again, it depends on the publisher. You have to make sure that you know you're adhering to the publisher's guidelines. Typically, novels, the word length is fifty thousand to you know, on up. Um, and I think, uh, you know, novellas, I find a lot of times, I haven't done it yet, but I find novellas, it's mostly written in the, in the viewpoint of like the main character or, or, or like the narrator, not necessarily that the, the, the narrator is, you know, speaking in like first, you know, person or whatnot, but it's typically we follow the main character and we're kind of mm -hmm. almost in his point of view. I don't think that's a hard and fast rule for novellas, but I find that that's the case with a, a lot of novellas I read. So would you say that a novella pretty much sticks to the main plot and there are no subplots? Sometimes I think again I think I think a lot of times yes because again you're you're kind of moving you're moving along with the main character but sometimes I think you can have um, I I just I think one of one of my favorite Stephen King novellas is The Langoliers which is actually the ironically the first miniseries of his I actually watched uh, mm -hmm. back when it came out in sixth grade I remember reading that book and if I'm if I remember correctly that has you know that it's characterized as a novella that was published in four past midnight which is a collection of novellas but mm -hmm. that novella had many different um, you know each you know each chapter had like you know different character viewpoints so I think it you know and they all had their you know kind of like, you know their characters their development and their kind of like their goals so I think it, it depends on um, the novella mostly it's most novellas these days um, we stick to kind of one ma main character that we're kind of following along there's other characters in the story but we're kind of following along with kind of like one main character usually interesting Let's speak to the business of, of writing as far as making a living. Now, I asked this question to all my guests. What was your family's reaction when you said, this is it, I'm going to be a writer? Have a day job. <laughs> yes. they, they, were very, they were very supportive, but they, you know, they, they wanted me to you know, be able to you know, write. And I'm, still, I'm not a full-time writer. This right. is a, you know, this is, it's kind of, it's a, it's a hobby side kind of, you know, um, it's, uh, but they, they did say that, you know, that's great, you know, do it, if that's what you want to do, do it, but have, have like a backup plan, have like a day job so that you can make a living so that you can pursue, you know, your creative writing, you know, ambitions. That's very interesting that you say that because I correspond with a writer in England. His name is Angus Donald. He writes a lot of Robin Hood stories and fantasy, and he Ooh. just released a, a book called The Berserker, The Last Berserker, and very, very nice guy, very personable. You can friend him on Facebook, and uh, and I gave him a couple of reviews because his genre is, I'm really into that kind of stuff, mm. medieval stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but he, I was shocked to learn that as popular as he is in England, and I thought around the world, he has a day job too. He doesn't make his whole living doing that. Yeah. And uh, I'm not, I, I, that disappointed me, not in him, 
but it disappointed me that great writers may for a very minority for a very minuscule part of their career actually learn earn their living just from writing it's it's very difficult i mean i know a, a, lot, a lot a lot of a lot of my writer friends we're you know we're uh we we write on the side but our you know our we have our day jobs yeah and it's it's very difficult to be able to do that full time unless maybe if your spouse has um, kind of like the full time job, or I mean, there could be different scenarios. But yeah, a lot of writers, it's they they, they need that day job because they, you know it's it's tough to kind of make a living just be just being a full time writer. Myself, I'm you know I haven't been published or anything yet, but I I I do my best at four in the morning. I get up and I'm writing by four thirty, and between four thirty and say six thirty, I'm writing. Okay. And it writing at the end of the day, I teach school as, as you know, mm -hmm. I am drained. I get home and I have the time, but mentally I am a zombie. Pardon the pun. You know, <laughs> we're talking about horror here. Um, but I, mean, I don't know, what's your best time of day to write? And do you find yourself sometimes when you come home from work being too drained to do it? I'm, I'm like you, I, I'm too drained to kind of, uh, to kind of write, um, you know, at, at night when I get home, unless, the, you know, like when, when cat creep, and I know we're going to talk about that later, um, unless like I, I'm on like a deadline and I have to get my edits done, then I'll kind of make that sacrifice. Mm. But uh, I, I'm like you, I will get up, uh, not at 430, but uh, I will wake up and I would, I like to kind of, you know, I'll, I'll either, you know, after I walk the dog, because again, I'm working from home, I've been right. trying to kind of write, you know, before work. Uh, lately, it's been, I've been working on, you know, um, school work, because I'm, I'm taking a middle grade and uh, young adult uh, fantasy writing course. So I've been trying to work on my final project, um, which is a spooky, it's a spooky kind of, you know, uh, middle grade, you know, spooky horror book. Uh, so I will write a lot of times before um, you know, I log into work. So, and then, and that's been, that's been phenomenal. Um, that's worked out very well for me. And um, I would like, you know, I want to continue that because it's like you said, it's like, you know, if you have like a, a goal, like a writing habit that if you can stick to that, you can get so many words in and, and, and write so much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I found that I did that and I kind of, I'm the type of writer that I'll, plan something and then as i'm writing i'll veer away from it meanwhile i'm keeping the eye on what the end i know the end of my novel you know but i've gotten to the point where my novel is like a jigsaw puzzle and i know i've written a whole bunch of stuff and i spend half my time looking for it <laughs> i find so with, with when i i i wrote a novel about maybe five or so years ago and I really need to go back to it and, and, and revise it because it's um, it's it, it's a it's a paranormal like murder mystery and I really need to go back to, to, uh, to work on it but what I found with me was before I wrote before I wrote the first chapter I had an outline uh, in mind and I had it you know chapter by chapter little, little description of what happens you know in each chapter and then I actually found that helped me um, stay organized and focused. And I think for me, um, it, it allowed me to, if I needed to veer off a little bit uh, and to not maybe stay on track with the outline, that was okay because I knew where I was eventually going. So I, I found that helped. I'm not sure if you outline or not, but I felt I found that helped immensely. I do outline, but I, I was way too ambitious in my first and only novel. And I have a lot of subplots and I go back and forth from, you know, one plot, main plot to subplot to yep. subplot. And I'm trying to make them all fit together. And I, I'm just, I'm just a disorganized person all the way around anyway. That's the way I work. And uh, I don't know, I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying it's very confusing and sometimes frustrating, but I have yeah. my good days and bad days. Yeah. I've written a lot of words and I hope I can all straighten them all out someday and publish you know i'm sure well if you ever need a beta reader you know where to i find I, I will consider that yes now let's talk about cat creeper it's set in vermont which is one of my all-time favorite states yep 
Very good. And I have the Kindle version, believe it or not. Even though I don't have a Kindle, I download it on my uh, laptop here and on my desktop. So I will read it, you know, during that, you know. Nice. Certain books, you know. Uh, I like how you start off and everything is normal and and you you set a very believable uh, path. I like that you... For me, the best horror is the horror that you can believe could happen in this world. And the only way to establish the the ridiculous or the paranormal is to have that sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do very, very well. I like this. Thank you. These people in there, they're likable and everything. And uh, tell us your process. And why do you think this novella got published and others may be like the vampire story did not yet. I think so. Uh, To kind of give a little backstory uh, of this book, I started this book, I want to say probably back either in sixth or maybe seventh grade. Hmm. And again, uh, it was because I wanted to write a Stephen King type of story. And like you Uh said, you know, King writes believable characters in these every, in these like, you know, horrific supernatural you know situations and that's why that's why he he's still um you know phenomenal a, 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 as right. a storyteller so yeah i i started it back in sixth seventh grade and i wanted to write a stephen king story and i remember being fascinated by the pet cemetery mm-hmm. uh paperback cover that my uh, parents bought me it was the original uh i think paperback kind of edition with the uh cat in kind of like the foreground and the uh, the man, um, Lewis Creed, Dr. Lewis Creed, walking into the pet cemetery in the, you know, mm-hmm. in the uh, background. And the idea of just, you know, bringing something back from the dead kind of intrigued me, kind of almost like that kind of Frankensteinish kind of pet cemetery kind of, yeah. kind of way. So I set a, I set up, I set about, you know, kind of doing my own version of this. I, I, I weaved in, you know, witchcraft is, and, uh, you know, the first draft of this, is you know it flows pretty much like the actual novella um, that you know came out. It you know it it was about ten thousand words, mm-hmm. and maybe give or take. But uh, I ended up losing the first draft of it. It was on oh. I wrote it on professional right. Oh my really god, that must have been devastating. Yeah, so I had to write it from scratch. But luckily, I this was the story I knew that whole plot all the characters, all like the motivations of these characters, all the scenes in my head. That's how much I was like totally invested in this story. Amazing. Yeah. So I, 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 I wrote it and I kept working on it throughout the years. I don't know if I don't recall working on it when I was at Emerson, maybe I did, but after I graduated and I started, you know, uh, meeting all, uh, you know, attending horror conventions, horror writing conferences, you know, book signings, I really started to kind of get back into the publishing arena. Mm -hmm. And I started again, I started working on the cat creeper. And I started sending it out to small press publishing companies. And they, they got, uh, got rejected Mm -hmm. many, many times as kind of like the, it's like kind of like our lot in life for like writers, it just, you know, rejection Mm -hmm. upon rejection. And but, you know, I just kept going, I still I, I, I sent it out, I would have, I, I ended up having, ultimately, I ended up having the Cat Creeper um, both uh, professionally edited and beta read. And two of my horror, horror writing buddies, uh, you know, good friends of mine, uh, Rob Smales and Stacey Longo, they own their own um, editing service company. Hmm. And they professionally edited it. They did a great job, uh, you know, pointed out, you know, kind of, you know, issues here and there, you know, you know, either character, you know, motivation issues, uh, you Mm. know, plausibility issues. So I worked on that. Um, And then I ended up sending it to a uh, friend of mine, Tom Deedy. He's a uh, phenomenal horror writer. He's a Bram Stoker award winning author of Haven. Uh, Again, he's, he's like a, he's like a, um, um, you know, very influenced by Stephen King, you know, like me. Sure. And he's just such a phenomenal horror writer. Haven, uh, Weekend Getaway is a great novella. And Eternal Darkness is like a throwback to like, you know, um, like, you know, like the uh, kind of like the uh, the pulpy kind of like, you know, vampire stories. 
and it's just he's such a, uh, an amazing writer. And uh, he ended up beta reading um, in, in addition or um, a, uh, a version of The Cat Creeper. And then after that, after I kind of, you know, I worked on that, another, you know, version, uh, ultimately I sent it to, I submitted it to Unnerving uh, because I discovered uh, their submissions call for Rewind or Die. And uh, the editor and owner of Unnerving, it's a Canadian based small press publisher, uh, Eddie Generous was the editor and publisher. And he was, uh, he put out a open submissions call for Rewind or Die. And the idea behind the Rewind or Die was he was looking for books that were, that, that, that the readers, um, you know, could, could almost kind of like, you know, it would like take them back to the kind of the horror movies of like the 70s, 80s, and 90s, kind of like the horror movies you'd peruse in the, uh, like the video rental stores. And I mean, I remember those even when I was a kid, and even though I was not a horror fan when I was a kid. I remember going to the video rental stores, uh, video gallery and movies on video and Melrose and perusing the horror sections. And I would see, I would pick up these, you know, like the, I, I picked up the horror, like, you know, um, the, uh, the VHS, you know, like, you know, rental um, cassette case for the serpent and the rainbow, the blob remake, uh, Hellraiser, and just being like really freaked out by them. And so I remember seeing the submissions call and he was, uh, you know, looking for these, you know, like, you know, stories, you know, books that would kind of, you know, like, you know, part, you know, take, take the reader back to those kind of, you know, remind, remind the readers of those types of, you know, books with the crazy plot lines, the, the over the top gore. So I was kind of, you know, I kind of, you know, thought to myself, like, well, do I have anything, either something new that I could write, or do I have something that, you know, I've already written that I can just kind of mm -hmm. work on. And I thought of the cat creeper. So I did, you know, one more uh, kind of revision, one more edit, and I submitted it. And about maybe like a few weeks later, or like a, uh, almost like maybe a, uh, yeah, literally like a few weeks, you know, or like a month later, I got, you know, the acceptance that it was, you know, accepted. So what a feeling that must yeah, be. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, that's great. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. And I wish you luck on all the other endeavors that you're doing screenplays novels short stories oh before we end let's talk a little bit about short stories now, absolutely you get into short stories because you felt maybe you weren't ready for a novel or do you like that form better why do people write short stories because i've never written one I, I love short stories i love short story collections by uh like stephen king's collections um you know, a lot of my writer friends have published short stories and published short story collections. I love short story anthologies. I just think short stories, um, first off, it's a great way to, um, whether you're reading them in a collection or like say if you're reading them in a magazine or an online zine mm -hmm. or in an anthology, uh, it's a good introduction for the reader, not necessarily for the writer, but for the reader to say, I like that writer. I like his style, you know, has he written mm -hmm. anything else, either short stories or novels? So I think it's a good thing for a reader to kind of get into your to your work. But also yeah. it's 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 fun to write because they're short. They're kind of like, you know, like they're kind of short and sweet. And you can tell a, mm -hmm. um, a compelling story or a horrific story mm -hmm. in kind of, you know, not as many words. And they're, they're just kind of fun to write, especially with, you know, submissions calls too, to kind of get your mind um, thinking too of something you know new you can write as well now it's funny about short stories i kind of have a love-hate relationship with them because we used to have to read them in college and as you know when you're told to read something and it's chosen for you you're not going to enjoy it as much as you would if it's for your leisure you know mm -hmm. so i bought this book uh probably 20 years ago or more and it's called uh an bet the world's best time travel short stories i love time travel stories science fiction that stuff like that fantasy so i pick it up and i'm reading it and i'm seeing oh, rod serling edgar Allan poe i didn't even know he wrote anything like prose you know and it was quite good yeah. and it was edited by this guy i won't say the guy's name because i'm gonna diss this guy i i go through all these stories and i find that the editor has his own story in there 
And it's, it's absolutely horrible, you know? So I, I, I kind of got in my mind like, yeah, he published this just as an excuse to get his name in between all these great writers like Rod Serling and Edgar Allan Poe and all those guys. But it didn't work, mister. That's what uh, I wanted to shout at the guy. You know, it was just, it's funny, but it's kind of, kind of pathetic at the same time, you know? I mean, it's, it's sorry that happened to you, but I, I can honestly say like, I love short stories. They, they yeah. are, they are, they're fun to write, but they're fun to read too. Cause again, you can kind of, there are some real gems out there. Yeah. I'm getting into them again. Now it took me a long time. I generally like, novels and i love not real big novels i was a big james mishner fan i don't know if you ever heard of him he, i have my grandmother used to read him yeah. yeah so i have all of james mishner's books huge books i read yes the source about the middle east it was 1088 pages i like getting immersed into that world that they create about you know whatever century it is yep uh how many generations it covers these generational uh, it was a mini series in the seventies as well. And I interviewed the author, uh, the director rather, uh, his name was Virgil W. Vogel. Hmm. I interviewed the director in, early in my video career. And I, I have, I, I must, I have to find that and transfer it and get it on YouTube. Cause I interviewed him. It was a pretty wide ranging interview, much like I'm doing with you right now. That uh, would be, I would watch that. Yeah, yeah. That would be really interesting. I've always wanted to read James Michener. Yeah. Like, I remember going over to my grandmother's house and looking at his books. She had them in like, you know, hardbound paperback. Yeah. Oh my yeah, She had a lot of his books. And, you know, because of my love for Michener, you would think that I write historical novels or hmm. historical stories, but I always wind up writing fantasy or science fiction. And I, I don't even understand it myself. I mean, I do read science fiction and fantasy, but, uh, I mostly I read like like Angus Donald I read before you know mm -hmm. like I mentioned before and I don't know I don't, I don't even understand myself but uh. <laughs> I think it's about something and sometimes it's it's always good to kind of write something a little out of your comfort zone too yeah you know yeah. something and you you might find that you know I actually really enjoy writing this I want to write more of this so I yeah. think that's you know try it sometime that's that's yeah, yeah. well I, I do plan on trying it if I but I've got to make myself finish what I'm writing I've been writing yes. it for twelve years Kevin. 12 yep. years on the same novel. So it, Len, it took me about 20, 25 years to uh, finally publish the cat creeper. So wow. it's, <laughs> I, love, good. I love your system of beta reading. You go from beta editors to beta readers. And by the time it's on the fourth or fifth one, it's pretty polished. I would imagine, you know, it is, but even still, the editor at uh, Eddie did a phenomenal job, uh, you know, kind of editing and kind of, you know, doing another edit through the Cat Creeper too. And it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I learned a lot, you know, to kind of, you know, in terms of, you know, not being in the character's head too many times. And it's like, that's kind of like a, um, you know, an issue that I have that I need to kind of like, you know, watch myself for. So it's, a, you know, I I've just learned a lot and also just, you know, be more descriptive um you know especially with some of the gore scenes because it's a creature feature and it's you know it's a monster on the killing rampage so it's like it's gotta you, you gotta amp up the gore and i just he kind of taught me to kind of you know to do more of that um to, to kind of be more descriptive you know what are we seeing you know you know kind of what's going yeah. on here so right very interesting well i want to thank you for this time kevin thank you len and uh it's been a lot of fun i i, I uh for all the people out there my last question what would the advice be for for people like they think they want to write, but they're not sure, or they're afraid what people will think, or they don't have the confidence? That's a big one that I that I know is an issue. What do you say to that? I think you know it's always nerve wracking to to get your stuff out there. Even when it's out there, it's nerve wracking. Are people going to like it? Uh, are people you know not not going to like it? I think the, the biggest advice is to you know to put, really just kind of take that leap and put yourself out there. And you know if if you're not sure of you know what of how your story is so far, you know get some trusted, you know whether they're uh, writers. I mean I always go go with writers, but, you know, people that you really trust that will give you, you know, constructive, you know, feedback to, to help improve your story, you know, seek those people out and, you know, cause they'll just, they'll help you make your, your story better. And yeah, just, just, just put yourself out there, kind of um, take a chance. Cause it's, uh, it's right. worth it. 
it really is. All right. Advice from a published author, Kevin Lewis. And thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for joining us today on What Do You Want to Do? Kevin Lewis is a fascinating guest, and we look forward to more published works from him in the future. Bigger and better, I'm sure. So until next time, what do you want to do?